Well, we're studying the Ten Commandments, God's most well-known rules and instructions. And this one, the Ninth Commandment, is the one that's in the news the most. God said, you shall not give false testimony against your neighbors. <laughs> this commandment is most commonly expressed as don't lie. Now, according to dictionary.com, a lie is a false statement made with deliberate attempt to deceive, a falsehood, something unintended or serving to convey a false impression. That's the dictionary definition. But lying has become so commonplace, we've created new terms. It's not a lie, it's fake news or alternate facts or our alternative truth. In the South, we even excuse lying by saying, oh, don't, don't pay any attention to that. That's just an. Like certain people are somehow exempt from the ninth commandment. But God says, you shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. Don't lie. There are different kinds of lies. If you tell a lie to be tactful or polite, that's called a white lie, which somehow you have decided doesn't count as a lie. According to researchers, three most common lies Americans tell are all white lies. I'm fine is the standard answer to how are you. 92% of people confess to telling that lie. 92%. 80% of people admitted saying, I love this present when they didn't. How many of you have done that? So that meant about 50% of you are liars. 78% of people claim to falsely say, I'm sick. But a white lie is still a lie. Broken promises when you don't keep your commitment to God or people are lies. Broken promises lead to broken relationships, broken trust, and broken lives. And you say, well, I, I never... I never should have said that. I never should have made that promise. It doesn't matter if you gave your word, you need to keep it. An exaggeration enhances a truth with lies. People mix truth with untruth to make a story better or more impressive. It sounds better to say you caught a four pound fish than to say it was barely bigger than the worm. And no one's hurt by that lie, right? The challenge with an exaggeration is that someone else may repeat your exaggeration as truth. And your exaggeration makes them a liar. I tell our team, don't tell me you had 100 people if you had 93. I want real numbers. I want facts. A deception is when you cause someone to believe something that isn't true. You may not actually speak a lie, but you make them believe a lie. I recently saw an amazing example. I want you to watch the people in the background. All right, watch. Okay, uh, picking it up here in Wilmington, North Carolina, right at the Intracoastal, and we're in one of these bands. This is about as nasty as it's been. We had some bands like this last night, and then the eyewall this morning, we were not on TV. It was the dark and raucous uh, night at the hotel, and this wind gusting again over 60 miles an hour, things blowing by, uh, pieces of limbs. This is what we're seeing a lot of, shingles coming off. You see what happens when you throw it off, it just takes off like a projectile. <laughs> he didn't lie. He wanted viewers to believe something that wasn't completely true. A fabrication, on the other hand, is purely made up. There's no truth in it. A bold-faced lie is a lie everyone knows is a lie. I've had people tell some crazy bold-faced lies about me. I listen and I think, well, no one can believe that. But they keep telling it until someone does. And sadly, the prevailing thought seems to be if you tell a lie often enough, people will believe it's true. So here are just real fast three of the favorite lies I've heard recently about me. He flies a helicopter everywhere he goes. <laughs> now, I would love to fly a helicopter everywhere I go. The problem is there's no room for a helicopter to land at Kilwins, <laughs> or for that matter, my house. He has 24-7 security. He drives a BMW. 
Now, 24-7 security would be absolutely awesome if they would drive me everywhere since I'm a horrible driver in my Ford truck, not my BMW, which I would love to have. It's a bold-faced lie. Borrowing a story is telling someone else's story as your own. Years ago, I was speaking at an event, and right before I went up, my host leaned over and said, hey, by the way, don't tell your tornado story. I said, what? He said, oh, I already used it. I said, wait a second, you told my story about me? He said, oh, I'm sorry, man. I told it like it happened to me. That's a lie. A half-truth is when you tell someone part of the truth, but not all of the truth. A half-truth is a whole lie. Finally, there are technical truths. Some of you are experts at this. A technical truth is exactly what it sounds like. You find a technicality so you can say you didn't lie. Let me give you a few examples. Well, I've never spent a dollar on that. True, you didn't spend a dollar, you spent ten dollars. Here's one that hits a little close to home. Did you pick out this card yourself? Well, yes, I did. And I'm going to go ahead and confess to this. Cindy likes cards. But when I give her a card, she always wants to know if I picked it out. And on several occasions, I just had someone else pick it up for me. It was kind of a, a minor deal in our marriage. So now when someone goes to buy, and Cindy has not heard this before, I'm confessing. Now when someone goes to buy a card for me, I ask them to buy two. And then when they get back, they hold them out, and I pick out the card. <laughs> so that's a technical truth. <laughs> or I'm on my way, which means you just got out of bed and you're, you're technically moving. Or sorry I'm late, I was caught in traffic. There were four cars at the stoplight when you were already 15 minutes late. Well, I didn't have a drink. You had three. A technical truth is still a lie. And a quick glance through Scripture underscores the importance of this ninth commandment. Proverbs chapter 6, there are six things the Lord hates, seven that are detestable to him. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked schemes, feet that are quick to rush into evil, a false witness who pours out lies, and a man who stirs up dissension among brothers. I mean, lying made the list twice. In Colossians 3, Paul wrote about the earthly nature, about your old life and leaving everything associated with it behind. Here's what he said. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived, but now you must rid yourself of all such things as these. Anger, rage, malice, slander, filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other. Since you have taken off your old self with its practices and have put on your new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge and the image of its creator. You have a new nature because Jesus is the Lord of your life. When you lie, you're returning to practices associated with your old life. And you're acting like the sinner you once were. Don't go back. Jesus, speaking about Satan, said he was a murderer from the beginning, not holding the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. The devil is the father of lies. When you lie, you are speaking Satan's language and acting like the devil's child, not God's. Honesty and truth is of God. Lying and deceit is of the devil. Lying misrepresents and dishonors God. One more, one more verse here. Paul wrote Ephesians 4. You were taught with regard to your former way of life. There it is again. Put off your old self, which is being corrupted by deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds. Put on the new self, created to be like God, in righteousness and holiness. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to his neighbors, for we're all members of one body. The word Paul used for falsehood means lies. Paul said, get rid of lies 
and speak truth because we're all members of one body and lying brings harm to the body of Christ. I often ask people questions I know the answer to just to see if they tell the truth. Their dishonest answer lets me know I can't trust them. Lying destroys trust. Lies may be forgiven, but they're rarely forgotten. Trust is broken for years, even a lifetime. Once you've established yourself as a liar, you will always be investigated to see if you're telling the truth. Finally, Revelation 21 gives us the worst consequence of breaking the ninth commandment. He said to me, it is done. I'm the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end. To him who is thirsty, I will give the drink without cost from the spring of the water of life. He who overcomes will inherit all this. I will be his God and he will be my son. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters, and all liars, their place will be in the fiery lake of burning sulfur. So again, look at the list. Liars are included with murderers, idolaters, and the sexually immoral as those who won't be included in heaven. So this is a big deal. When you lie, you risk hell. So with so much on the line, why would people lie? I don't know all the reasons. I can think of a few. Some people lie because of fear. They're afraid of losing a relationship or a job. They actually fear the consequences of truth more than the consequences of lying. Some lie because of pride. They don't want people to know about their mistakes and failures. Or they want people to see their victories as bigger than they are. Some lies are born of green, greed, online scams, fake fundraisers, all lies designed to make the liar rich. You might lie because of insecurity. You're, you're afraid if people really knew you, they wouldn't like or accept you. Some people lie to get attention. You see it in the news. People fake cancer, pregnancy, or death in their family to get attention and sympathy. Others lie to hurt others or their reputation. Their goal is to invict, inflict pain or to turn people against their target. Social media often allows those lies to reach further faster. That's closely related to gossip, which is an ugly sin that destroys God's church. Finally, some people lie. Just see if they can get people to leave it, believe it. For them, it's a game. They make up crazy news to see how many people they can fool. Disney giving away free tickets if you'll repost. Facebook giving away money. How about this one? Facebook creating a new algorithm restricting what you see to only 26 people. I can't tell you how many fall for that, even when all you have to do to prove it wrong is scroll down. It's a lie. And a whole lot of you are thinking, oh, I need to go delete that off my feed. <laughs> Regardless of the reason or the excuse, lying is a sin that clearly violates the ninth commandment. It's not an option for the follower of Jesus. As followers of Jesus, we're called to be different. And God said to his people, you shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. So I want to take a few minutes and look at the other side of the equation, truth telling. When you tell the truth, you don't have to worry about being discovered or found out. You don't have to remember what you said. It can be difficult keeping up with what lie you told what person, but the truth stands for itself. When you tell the truth, your conscience is clear. You can lay your head on the pillow at night knowing you've done right before people and before God. When you tell the truth, you promote unity. Unity is built on trust. Trust is established by truth. When we trust each other, we are able to stand strong against Satan's deceptions and Satan's lies. We are stronger together because of truth. Now, sadly, if you tell the truth, even if you say it in the right spirit with the right motive, you'll still have enemies. Why? Because truth divides. Now, not everyone wants to hear truth or acknowledge truth. Tell the truth anyway. Truth, every soul matters to God. Truth, as a church, our priority must be 
the priority of our Father, Jesus, who, who, whose priority is to reach people who don't yet know him. Truth, there can be no prejudice in the body of Christ. Now, I've had people decide I was the enemy because of that truth. But God has called us to reach all kinds of people. All ages, all races, all economic classes, all backgrounds. That is a clear truth in Scripture and a clear truth for us. That truth forces a decision. You can decide, I will put aside my preferences and prejudices and embrace the whole body of Christ. Or you can decide, I don't believe that. I reject the teaching of Jesus, and I reject the idea that every soul matters to God. I'm going to find a place where people are just like me. You can choose. I'm not going to worship with those kind of people. You say, Pastor Rod, no one would say that, do you? They have. They did, and they left. But their stubborn ignorance doesn't change truth. All truths divide because truth forces a decision. The truth draws a line in the sand. You have to decide whether to accept, believe, and act on truth. Paul wrote, instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow up in all things into him who is head, that is Christ. Speaking the truth in love is a practice that's been neglected in the church for far too long. We avoid truth for fear of hurting feelings or losing a relationship. But we must be truth tellers. Now, I know what some of you are thinking. This is awesome. I got some people that I want to tell some truth. In fact, I'm starting my email right now. Watch this truth. That is a typical reaction to think about telling others the truth instead of opening your ears to hear the truth. So before you do that, let me challenge you with a few things. Truth-telling should be motivated by love, not anger. It's easier to avoid telling someone a hard truth. It's easier to opt out of difficult conversation. But love compels you to action. It forces you to sit down face to face and say, I'm concerned about you. I see something in your life that worries me. I'm determined to have the difficult, truthful conversation in an atmosphere of love for the purpose of building others up. It's not always easy. It's hard to share difficult truth. It's, it's often difficult to share it in love. So here's a good principle. If you can't share the truth in love, then you're the wrong one to share it. Maybe you've heard someone say, well, I just tell it like it is. Right before they lay into someone with their angry opinions and their vicious words. That is not a unity-promoting body of Christ building truth tiller. That is a jerk who uses the twisted weapon of truth to intimidate other people. And that kind of person has no place in church. So you don't like that. <laughs> but if you're excited about confronting someone with the truth, you're the wrong person. Keep your thoughts to yourself until you're able to have the character developed by the Holy Spirit that allows you to speak truth in a loving, redemptive way. The goal of truth-telling is to redeem and restore, not to condemn and punish. A truth-teller genuinely wants the hearer to grow and achieve God's purpose. His aim is not to produce pain or to punish the person in any way. I get nasty emails filled with vicious words that question my motives, my character, my words, my actions. That's not a truth teller. That's an attack. The goal determines the approach. If your goal is not redemptive, then you shouldn't be the one to speak or confront. I love email and Facebook and text, but truth should be told in person, face to face. People who try to be truth tellers in emails usually aren't effective in communicating in the right spirit. Too often they sit behind their computer keyboard late at night and spew out their anger. If you have the thought, well, I'm going to send him an email and tell him like it is, you're probably not being used by God. 
Don't confront over email. This is so important. You need to see the other person and how they react. They need to see the love in your eyes so they know that you genuinely care and are concerned for them. Truth-telling happens best in the context of trusting relationships. When people know someone loves them and has their best interests at heart, they're more willing to hear truth. And here's what I've learned. Many times I need to wait and prove my love before I have the difficult conversation. Truth-telling should always be preceded by prayer. Godly truth-tellers pray about it and think about it in advance. They agonize over how they'll say it and how the other person will respond. Most of the time they dread it, but they're relationally invested enough to follow through. I've never met someone who loves confrontation and is good at it. Pray before you share because truth-telling is a huge risk. Difficult conversations don't always go well. I've had instances where I knew telling the truth would cost me a friendship. I've had times I knew it could result in someone leaving the church. I've had times I knew the person would mount an attack against me and spread lies if I was a truth teller in their life. I've lost relationships because I told the truth, because I cared enough to step in and try to make a difference. I've cried a lot of tears after truth-telling conversations. A few while writing this message. I've talked to people about addictions and affairs and leadership flaws. And knew going into it, it wasn't going to be easy or fun. So when I need to have a painful conversation with someone, I pray. And here's how I pray. This is what I suggest you pray. Lord, let my observations and suggestions be received in the right spirit. Let my words be laced with love and compassion. Lord, reveal to me if my motive is wrong in any way. Show me how to communicate your truth in a way that pleases you. Even though it's scary and it can go wrong, love others enough to tell the truth. If you don't, you're what is called an enabler. An enabler convinces himself that by helping you avoid truth, he's showing you acceptance and forgiveness and love. An enabler may even say that the truth tellers are against you. I've spent a lot of time with ministers who've fallen and failed. Most of the time, they didn't have a truth teller in their life or they weren't willing to listen. Or someone tried to be that and was rejected. Keep truth tellers in your life who love you and have your best interests at heart. I thank God for the truth tellers in my life. I may not always enjoy the truth they tell, but I thank God that they love me enough to tell it. They're not the enemy. If you get mad when someone tells you the truth, go back and apologize. Say it this way. Hey, sometimes I get my feelings hurt, but I needed that. I know you love me. Please don't stop. Please keep telling me the truth. I need you. I've sat with people and said, you can't keep doing that. It's sin. And if you continue on this path, God can't bless or use you. You'll destroy your family, your ministry, your life. At times I've been rejected and painted as the enemy. I've even had them repeat things that I never said because they didn't want to hear the truth. Some people are so unwilling to hear or acknowledge the truth, they decide anyone who disagrees with their fantasy is an enemy. It's a sad thing when you become someone's enemy by telling them the truth. The question is, is it worth diluting the truth to remain friends? If you do, are you really their friend? No. If you really love someone, you'll tell the difficult truths. If you know I love you, and you know I have your best interests at heart, then you know I'll be truthful with you. If I am really your friend, I have to be willing to risk everything to save you from tough consequences and eternal judgment. Here's how Proverbs 27 says it. It's better to correct someone openly than to have love and not show it. The slap of a friend can be trusted to help you but the kisses of an enemy are nothing but lies. 
Maybe you're struggling with someone who's expressed concern or, or who has confronted you in an area of your life. Students, you might be angry with your class pastor or youth pastor for confronting you or expressing a concern. Adults, you might be angry with a friend or a leader for addressing an issue or a leadership issue. Know this, if you make truth tellers your enemy, you'll be blinded to the truth. You eliminate your best source of feedback and godly correction. And we all need godly correction. You need someone in your life who loves you enough to confront you when you're headed the wrong direction. Someone who cares enough about you to express concern over your decisions. Someone who's committed enough to say, I see a pattern in your life that concerns me. Someone willing to say that sin and that sin carries horrible consequences. You got to stop and you got to make this right. Often the truth hurts, doesn't it? Not knowing the truth hurts much, much more. God said, you shall not give false testimony against your neighbors. Love tells the truth. In fact, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 13, love rejoices in the truth. So maybe there's somebody you need to have an honest conversation with. And while I'm talking, you're thinking about the truth you have yet to tell. You need to come clean. Say, well, I'm afraid what's going to happen. I've already told so many lies. Stacking more lies on top of the old lies won't make it better. It's time to come clean, tell the truth. Maybe a, a lie you've told has been weighing you down. Telling the truth is going to be difficult, but it's the right thing. You know you need to do it. It's time. Make the call. Have the conversation. Confess the hidden sin. It's not going to be easy, but the payoff is worth it. Maybe there's somebody in your life that you see something that you're concerned about and you know you need to have a tough conversation, but you're worried. You're worried how they'll respond. You, you're worried that you'll lose the relationship. I want to pray with you. And I want to pray that you'll take these practical steps and that you will be a truth teller who shares the truth in love. Would you bow your heads with me? Heavenly Father, I pray for people in this room and watching online who are breaking this commandment. They're lying. And they know it's time to come clean. For some of them, it's a, a lie that's they've told so many times that it's become their truth. But deep down inside, they know it's not true. Lord, I pray you would give them the courage to obey your commandment and to tell the truth. To confess the real truth. Lord, I know it's not going to be easy. But would you help them to tell the truth and continue to tell it? Lord, I pray for people who've been avoiding a difficult conversation because they fear the consequences of telling truth. Lord, I pray that you would fill them with a heart of compassion for the person they need to speak with. Fill them with love. Lord, that they would be able to tell the truth in a loving, redemptive way, not an angry, confrontive way. Lord, I pray that you would shape their character and their attitude enough that their words would be received in the spirit in which they're given, the spirit of love. Lord, we help us not to be enablers that walk around tiptoeing around real issues, avoiding truth because we don't want to hurt feelings. But teach us, Lord, Teach us to tell the truth in love in a way that honors you and promotes unity in the body of Christ. And finally, Lord, I pray for conviction over lies. Even the, the things we say that aren't technically lies, but they cause someone else to believe something that isn't true. 
Lord, I pray that we would be known as truth tellers and that we would honor you, honor your word, and obey your command by telling the truth. Forgive us, we pray, and help us to change in a way that brings glory and honor to you. In Jesus' name, amen.